Okay, hello everyone. Um, my name is Sunil Agarwal. It's a really honored to be here with you today. Um, I'd like to thank my fellow panelists also for uh, getting to be part of this with you all. And I want to just do two shout outs to my colleagues to my right. Uh, Amanda Ryman is uh, uh, I've known for many years and, and my PhD work at the University of Washington. Uh, I relied on her uh, doctoral work uh, in order to develop the surveys that I used uh, to survey the Washington uh, State um, Medical Cannabis patients. So I want to honor her work. Uh, uh, These are the leader in seeing uh, patients at uh, medical cannabis dispensaries and healthcare facilities. And then uh, far to the right, uh, Dr. Matthew Stella. Uh, I want to honor him because uh, he actually interviewed me when I was applying for admission to the University of Washington School of Medicine in 2002. That was almost 15 years ago, 16 years ago, something like that. And I still remember that, that day. It was the first time that I you know, wrote down that I wanted to, to, to talk to researchers in cannabinoids and that we actually had researchers at the university who were paid, had done research in cannabinoid uh, receptors and molecules and uh, Dr. Stella uh, met with me and he's like, wow, you actually have read something about this. That's, that's pretty good. So that was, it was nice to finally start getting credit for cannabis science as opposed to discredit. So anyway, thank you, Matty. Um, okay, so what I'm gonna talk to you guys about in my time today is uh, what, I'm, what I'm doing in Washington State now as a uh, physician, uh, clinician, and as uh, I also do teaching, and I do a little bit of uh, research um, and I'm going to touch on some of those things today. Uh, I think Laura Kaminsky, thank you for inviting me and asking me to kind of describe a little bit about my practice. And, uh, and then I also want to put some regulator recommendations uh, based on what things I'm seeing in, in the trenches. So um, back in early, of, uh, about a year ago, uh, I started doing one day a week uh, at an integrative medicine practice that had been established in Bellevue, Washington called Sage Med Integrative Medicine, which was founded by some naturopathic physicians, Sage Wheeler. And um, I had my, my friend there who's also seen patients in physical medicine. He invited me to come join as the allopathic doctor, the MD with the group of integrative practitioners. So I was excited about starting to expand my practice like that. And um, over the course of last 2017, I moved it from one day, uh, one day a month, two days a month, and, and November 1st, I went uh, full time. And uh, I just tell you, it's been quite an experience and trip. The kinds of things you get to see when you're no longer, um, you know, an employee doc working in a big system, but you're actually trying to kind of see whoever comes to your door um, and trying to help them in whatever ways you can. Uh, and my 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 areas of clinical training are in physical medicine and rehabilitation and hospice and palliative medicine. And both of those um, have included training in pain management as well. Um, so those are kind of the worlds that I, um, you know, put out there. And I've made uh, efforts over the last few months to try to ensure that I can see as many types of patients that I can see uh, that I can um, by accepting multiple forms of payers, i.e. insurers. Everything from um, all, pretty much all major private insurers in Washington State. Um, starting um, sometime in the early November, I also got added to Medicare. So all patients on Medicare, which includes people over the age of 65, and young people who have chronic diseases such as on hemodialysis, who are also on Medicare, even though they're, they might be younger because of disability or spinal cord injury. Uh, and I also was added to the provider one, which is the state Medicaid, the major state Medicaid program, uh, which includes Washington Apple Health and, and others, Molina. So that's, that's also been kind of a, uh, a new experience to see the range of type of patients from poor to more well-off, um, those living with serious life-threatening illnesses to those who are um, living with chronic diseases to those who are um, recovering from chronic diseases. So um, that's another feature of the practice. Um, so what, I'm, what I've noticed, what I'm trying to do with the cannabinoid side of things, I'm kind of calling it, people call this cannabis integrative medicine or cannabinoid integrative medicine because you know cannabis needs to fit into some schema of, of clinical care. 
Um, it's, uh, it's certainly a great medicine on its own, but it's, it's part of traditional medicine systems um, uh, where in which plants have been the centerpiece. I, like Ayurvedic medicine, traditional Chinese medicine, things like that. Uh, and in, in my practice, I sort of see it as and how to integrate it into regular medical care that people are already, um, you know, receiving. Uh, in our in our stage med clinic, we also have acupuncturists, physical therapists, massage therapists, um, and uh, as I was mentioning, the naturopathic physicians, including one naturopathic physician is also an uh, advanced registered nurse practitioner. So um, this gives me a chance to. Um, recommend the patients other types of care or I'm able to see how other forms of medicine see them or um, how to, what would cannabis do when patients are also receiving acupuncture. Um, because I don't know, if you guys have studied, if you study the endocannabinoid system, you'll see that cannabis isn't the only thing that you know activates it or that can be, can be modulating of the endocannabinoid system. Many, many essential functions, and you know, Dr. Stella can tell you much, much more about that. But um, what, there's research that's been done on the use of electroacupuncture as a way to stimulate endocannabinoids in the skin. Um, and there's been research done um, on uh, osteopathic manipulative treatments as a way to boost endocannabinoid tone in the uh, spinal fluid. Um, and there's been research on running and exercise as a way to increase endocannabinoid tone and um, masturbation to orgasm to increase endocannabinoid tone. So you can do a lot of things. <laughs> Some real sex researchers in Germany did this. Uh, I'm sure it works other ways besides masturbation too, but point, point being, uh, uh, I mean, I guess that was probably the way the uh, review board signed off on the research. Um, so, <laughs> it's ethical issues. Anyway, this is, the, this is what I'm talking about. It really is, it's opened, the, the study of cannabis opened up so much uh, deeper understanding of how, you know, the human body, and not just the human body, but, you know, many biological uh, systems, animals from sea squirts on up, work. And um, so it makes sense to me, you know, trying to be a clinic, clinical practitioner to try, try to think about patients in, this, in the framework of, well, what can we do with your endocannabinoid system? Is, is potentially your tone low or high, or how can we modulate it? Because cannabis is a homeostatic modulatory, oh, I mean, the endocannabinoid system is a homeostatic modulatory system, and many naturopathic doctors, including um, Michelle Sexton, who was a postdoc in Nephi Stella's lab, um, she has written about cannabis as an adaptogen. Um, things like ashwagandha, which is a herb, herb from Ayurvedic medicine, is classified as an adaptogen, and um, Tulsi. So how can we um, best utilize those in, in concert? The hard thing to do, uh, the hard thing about this compared to my colleagues who are doing, you know, metabolic workups of patients and using whole genome analysis to understand are these patients slow methylators, do they have hormonal deficiencies, you can't really do that with um, uh, endocannabinoids at this time because uh, to, you, to draw a blood sample and figure out somebody's endocannabinoid tone, you have to freeze that down. And, uh, I'm sure Nephi Stella can tell you way more about the complexities of, of measuring actual endocannabinoid levels. So we have to use clinical markers. And it's been really amazing to use, uh, to learn from uh, Ethan Russo, who's, you all know well, in Bound Bashan Island, one of the international leaders in this field. He's written about the clinical endocannabinoid deficiency syndrome. Um, migraine headaches, fibromyalgia, irritable bowel syndrome is kind of a triad, and he's included other conditions like endometriosis and other conditions which give us a sense into how patients might have a, these complex sy symptoms and the research studies have shown that endocannabinoid deficiencies might be involved. So I've been able to uh, integrate, um, try to trial cannabis products for these types of patients. Um, and things seem, there are some patients that have gotten quite, quite a bit of nice results. Uh, and so I'm very happy that the, the medical system has available cannabinoid ratio, compound CBTHC ratio, oral extracts that I can use. Um, I must say, I do have challenges with um, <clears throat> trying to utilize um, higher CBD uh, products because they're just not so available. And it's certainly true, a whole plant CBD rich extracts, probably you, you can get away with a lower dose than what the research studies have been done with pure CBD. 
Um, so for example, a recent study in the American Journal of Psychiatry was in London on schizophrenia, showed a thousand milligrams of CBD uh, a day uh, was uh, effective for treating severe schizophrenic patients compared to standard, they were actually already on their standard antipsychotics and they added CBD and, and they had improvements. Um, another study, well, studies from Brazil showed 300 milligrams of CBD was effective in social anxiety. Uh, and then a recent um, uh, preliminary study from Yasmin Hurd's team at Mount Sinai showed 400 to 800 milligrams was effective in a subject undergoing heroin withdrawal. Um, so, I mean, but where can you find 400 milligrams of CBD at the neighborhood 502 shop? Uh, and, and how much are you going to pay for that? Uh, and maybe, you know, they use pure CBD so maybe we can get away with 50% of it, I don't know. But I have had patients who've had success coming off of clonazepam, which is also a tip he's been on it for several years, and um, we've been able to do a slow dose taper using, um, I think he's using 5 to 1 uh, CBD THC ratio uh, vape pens and extracts, uh, and that's been, well, he's already more than 30, 40% down. I've had a patient who's been dealing with Cymbalta withdrawal for many years, um, which is another um, typical drug to come off of, um, and she's having good success with modulating some of her um, hyper hyperarousal symptoms uh, with CBD rich products. So I just just want to give you a feeling of some of the things. I also see pediatric patients and adults. Um, I think there are some challenges for uncovered pediatric health conditions um, and licensed drivers between the ages of 16 and 20. Uh, because if you're a licensed driver between the ages of 16 and 20 and you, ha you happen to have a medical condition uh, that um, will, will benefit from cannabis, uh, you can be medically authorized, but you can, if you're at risk of, uh, of, of a, um, you know, uh, automatic conviction, if you have any amount of THC in the whole blood study, if somebody rams into you and the, the police officer wants to do blood testing. And, uh, I have I have written some, I've been involved in some legal uh, matters or written pay, uh, letters for patients who've had some issues um, when they had alcohol related uh, driving issues that were their fault um, or something something like that. So, but we have no I've called the uh, Department of Health, campus um, you know, regulators, and they just say no. There's nothing we can do um, for these drivers. Uh, so they, they just can't drive cars legally, and that's a problem. Uh, ditto on um, mental health conditions. If you do have anxiety and we don't have PTSD or traumatic brain injury and we know that CBD has anxiolytic properties and, and THC-CBD ratios can help with that, why aren't we um, allowed to authorize patients to use that? And I think that has to do with the stigma of mental health conditions. Um, and then, you know, I, I feel like we need to do some more with um, clearing up the stigma of cannabis use in public places and in healthcare facilities. Uh, I had spoken to the Department of, um, to Christy Weeks, who previously used to run the program at the Department of Health, and she had said they have no issues with cannabis use in healthcare facilities, hospitals, nursing homes from the state regulatory standpoint. Um, but I don't think state facilities who are regulated by, you know, the, the, the state hospital commission or the state nursing home commission know that the state has no issue with, you know, qualified cannabis use in their facilities. And that would help to make the administrators in those facilities more comfortable with cannabis uh, use, uh, which those patients uh, and people, citizens, should have access to under the state law. Uh, so those are just a few of the health, the, the regulatory issues I want to touch on. Research and teaching, I can't really talk too much about, but I have to train residents uh, and medical students, so I, I, I'm happy to try to pass this information on to future generations coming up who have much more open understanding of these issues because many of them were born after medical marijuana even existed as a thing. So they've never known a time without it. And um, I'm doing work on cannabis as a traditional medicine uh, on the research side and how to deal with the stigma of contraband and how to preserve traditional uh, medical uses such as has been done in India and other places. Thanks for your time. here in a room full of leaders. All of you all are leaders in, in one aspect of this um, industry or another. And what I would like to go over is how we can all create more leaders 
and the messaging that we are going to provide and different ways of being able to legalize and create security for this industry um, legally. Um, I am the CEO of EMOT, and we have been doing cannabis extractions for about 22 years. And what, when I came aboard in about 2009, um, it was pretty clear to me that of all of the different kinds of methodologies that the founder of the company had created, that he was, he was very, very into botanicals as medicine and food, and that was the reason why I had to move from back to Seattle from Miami, was to get into nutrition and, and as medicine and food. That path didn't exactly happen, <laughs> but um, with what I realized there are a few. There were a few extraction methodologies that were creating an Achilles heel for the industry. <clears throat> Primarily, anything that you know blew up. So I said, "All right, we are only going to uh, promote CO2 and ethanol for this industry because without a pure, safe product, there's no way that this is going to move forward as fast as it could without a clear pathway for." Um, for fire departments, for the police, for the police, for medical applications, for all of them. We couldn't legalize on un medical without that. So we did. And um, we created basically um, the CO2 aspect of this whole industry. Um, we have a million good competitors now. <laughs> but um, that's okay. <laughs> um, but both for the founder, myself, and the entire company, our main purpose is, is completely focused on plants as nutrition and medicine, and getting that message across in everything we can possibly do to do it, because that is our security for this industry, and being able to create successful businesses that can then turn around and give that same messaging back is how we create more leaders and how we continue to move forward. I came to be here because I am an anti person, triple anti personality. <laughs> I'm a total workaholic, and I, I recognized when I was living in Miami that um, it would be really cool to create some kind of retreat where people can, like, like myself could go and get you know advice on nutrition, exercise, learn how to take care of themselves. Because face it, as somebody just recently told me, if I don't get the oxygen mask first, I can't help anybody else. And so I want to make it clear too to all of you here, because think about that, you all need the oxygen mask first, okay? Because without you, um, as leaders, there's nothing. And I think uh, Wired Magazine, sometime in the mid-2000s, did a, um, an article that Seattle was the number one most likely place that socially responsible businesses would come from. It's an epicenter for this. So we are perfectly situated being interested in sustainability and where our food comes from, being foodies and all of that. It's a perfect storm. And I do a lot of national traveling. And I can tell you too that we live in a, in a hot knowledge bubble here. Um, all, of the, all of the new extraction methodologies that I have seen um, using normal, uh, already established scientific extraction technologies came from here first. So it's our responsibility to keep this moving forward, which is why I want to show you this. This orange is a whole food. And inside this orange, you've got the pulp, and then you have this white stuff, it's called pith. And inside of there are really important nutrients. And, the, and actually, the skin has almost more vitamin C than the, the, the pulp does, right? You can juice this. Whoop, oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's also slippery. <laughs> yeah, so you can juice this. Um, but the danger of just having the juice is that you get too much sugar, and you can raise um, insulin levels. And, but it, as opposed to just you know eating this whole fruit, obviously the outer skin it feels also extremely nutrition and nutritious, and it's full of delightful terpenes. 
Cannabis is the same thing, except far, far, far beyond. It is almost practically a whole food. It's high in protein. It has almost a perfect ratio <coughs> of omega-6 to omega-3 oils. It has, um, it's, well, it has so many different nutrients that we need that it actually is a food. But who's talking about that? Uh, there's a great, there's a gal, Pam Dyer, who's local, who does a um, fantastic Instagram account, you should see it. Uh, it's uh, Butter, the Butterfly Sessions. And she does a beautiful job of marketing this concept of actually raw cannabis. So we've got primarily the THCA, the CBDA, which anybody can utilize for health and well being. And that is how we should be marketing cannabis. Because if we can get through to everyone as far as it just being a food, then it, it, you can't categorize it anymore. It's, you can't just place it in pharmaceutical. You can't just place it in, in medical or just recreational. We, we need to create a nutraceutical definition in this country. Other countries have a nutraceutical definition, which is basically a food with, with medicinal values. We don't, but we can cannabis and we can create this market all we have to do is focus on it and continue to create more leaders all along these lines as an extraction company this philosophy puts us in a very interesting position because obviously you can isolate anything I mean, it's nothing new. There's a whole lot of people isolating different things out of the plant now. They think it's all wonderful and great, and you know they're all excited about. Well, it's not new. Hello, we've been doing that to plants forever. That's the problem. We started uh, taking components out of plants in the uh, 1800s. We took the first thing that we took out of, of a plant was morphine out of poppies. Look where we're at. Do we really want to go down that path with this plant? because this plant is our way out of that methodology. This plant could completely change our entire medical system by utilizing what we now know about the endocannabinoid system and the entourage effect and having people's endocannabinoid systems analyzed and treating individual endocannabinoid system deficiencies because we all have them and we're all different. And so that would create compound pharmacies Four count, I'm getting, I'm getting myself chill bumps. I don't know about you guys. <laughs> we, could, we could have um, compound pharmacies um, based on this plant. And many years ago, when we first started legalizing on CBD, some of us knew that it was kind of yes. Because and Tika Molam in Israel has been studying this for well over a decade, that CBD alone is not that effective for very long. You, you have to add THC back into it. CBD has a bell curve. And they discovered this, and they added a little bit of THC back in. It made the, the FSC increase the efficacy, and then it stabilized. This plan is telling us what we need to do. And yeah, sure, at the time, I was like, yeah, go ahead, legalize on CBD. Because you're going to figure out that once you've already legalized, whoops, we're going to have to add some other cannabinoids in there, maybe some terpenes. And we're still going down that path, but there's still only a few of us who really, in the whole scheme of things, who really understand this. And we have to message it. You can have the best widget to, you can have the best lawnmower on the entire planet. But if you don't message it and you don't market it, no one is going to know. You have to talk about it. And you have to make it a part of every single marketing thing that you can think of. And just as far as, far as farmers go, think about, you know, it's, I know that there are a lot of farmers in this room. And it has been so unbelievably difficult. It almost makes you want to cry how hard it has been for them this last couple of years. Think about if we had a raw market, a raw cannabis market and how much more you'd be able to sell to be able to have that. And the normalization that I would, that would bring to the, to the industry and the plant by just saying, well, I'm just gonna eat it. It doesn't, you know, I'm gonna juice it. It doesn't 
create that, that psych that, um, psychotropic feeling. And it's just about health and well-being. And if we can get that messaging across, we'll all be more secure. Now, I don't want to downplay isolates all that much. Obviously, isolates are awesome. I just want to emphasize that when we do do isolates, we do it responsibly. We can have we can have the orange, or we can take a vitamin C pill. And we can take the vitamin C pill, but we're not going to get the, the bioflavonoids. We're not going to get any of the other properties. That this, the reason why this is on this planet was to feed us, basically. And certainly with cannabis. I mean, that is unbelievably evident. It is made, we are made for each other. And to be able to, to bastardize that is sad. It makes me sad. And I would like to keep getting this message across that recreating things for specific illnesses is fantastic. But we still have so far to go to understand all, what all of them do our endocannabinoid system, how the artifact effect works, all of it. And, but just to keep open minds and keep that sense of responsibility alive and well, and so that we can all continue to grow and we can change so many other things that this plant is speaking to us to change. Um, so my name is Amanda Ryman, and um, first I want to say that the ideas behind an endocannabinoid deficiency syndrome are in my world, and getting really excited. I mean, I totally hear where you're coming from. I mean, the idea that we could actually assess the functioning of someone's endocannabinoid system when they are very young and then give them supplemental therapy so that they never develop epilepsy, or they never develop MS, I mean, it's a game changer, and I, I tell all the students I know that if you are at all interested in science, go into the field of endocannabinoid research, because it's going to be the future, and it's just it's great. Um, so, you know, Sunil and I, we were saying when we were getting lunch today that we don't often get to sit on panels together anymore, because there was a time 15 years ago when there were so few cannabis scientists that any time they wanted a science panel, we were all on it. Um, but now we have had the opportunity to diversify to where, you know, we have the biologists and the genome scientists and the social scientists and the addiction researchers um, who are all starting to specialize in cannabis. And I get really excited when I get emails from PhD students and grad students who say, I'm doing my dissertation on cannabis, I'm doing projects on cannabis because I don't want to do it forever. And I really want to be able to give the reins to the younger generation, but I feel that um, as we move more towards legitimacy and regulation, there's a sense of the social movement behind cannabis that doesn't always come along with that transfer of knowledge. And we're transferring knowledge about cell cultures, and we're transferring knowledge about the endocannabinoid system. Are we really transferring the knowledge about the culture and the importance of the social movement that was medical cannabis? So that's really what I want to touch on a bit today when I talk about kind of my own <coughs> research path in this world. Um, so just to say right now, um, my current position is not in research fully. Um, I work with a company in California called Flocana, which is a branded cannabis distribution company that works with small sun-grown farmers in Mendocino and Humboldt County. Um, I myself live in Mendocino County, so Mendocino, Humboldt, and Trinity make up the Holy Grail, the Emerald Triangle. So if you're interested in that part of my life, I'd be more than happy to talk with you about it during the networking session or dinner tonight. But today I'm going to talk about the science. Um, so, uh, you know, as Sunil was talking about the synergistic effects of cannabinoids and things like acupuncture and masturbation, um, I think that how I can best describe the work that I do is very similar to what Sunil does, except in a 10,000 foot view. So my interest has always been the intersection between cannabis and different aspects of social justice, healthcare, social movements, um, equity, equality. 
because uh, I feel like cannabis touches all of those aspects. And in many ways throughout our history, cannabis has been part of a catalyst for social change. And it continues to be that today. It was that back in the 1960s when we started the war on drugs, basically to jail people who were using cannabis to promote social change. Um, it's continued through um, people getting their children taken away and having to become medical refugees because they want to make good health care decisions for their families. It continues um, with the small sun-grown farmers that refuse to go the way of large industrialized agriculture and instead want to change the way we do food production in the U.S. rather than go that direction. Um, so cannabis has been involved in all of that. And I think it's very important for anybody who hopes to be successful in this industry to really understand the history of cannabis as a social movement. So I moved to the Bay Area, to Oakland in 2002 from Chicago. Um, I really had no idea about medical cannabis except the small bits I'd seen on the news. Um, when I arrived in the Bay Area, I became a medical cannabis patient because I had been using cannabis to treat my own arthritis for years in Chicago, of course, very, very much in the illicit market. When I started to visit dispensaries back then in the early 2000s in Oakland, Berkeley, and San Francisco, what I noticed was something very unique, cannabis aside. Um, so I was also a PhD student at Berkeley in social welfare. So the idea was that I was kind of studying social movements and the social welfare program. And what I saw when I went to those early dispensaries was unlike anything I had seen in any other area of healthcare, which is a truly socialized, community-based healthcare system that did not just tolerate marginalized populations, but actually actively sought to care for marginalized populations. And this was born out of HIV activism and the LGBTQ movement in San Francisco. So just a little bit of a quiz, and this is not going to take away your ability to do anything later. Um, how many of you have heard of Brownie Mary Rathburn? Okay, and how many of you have heard of Dennis Perone? Woo! All right, good, that's good, that's good. Um, so I just want to give a little brief history for those of you who may not know who these folks are. Um, so back in San Francisco in the 1980s, the AIDS epidemic was in full swing. And as many of you know, who are old enough to remember, there was a lot of misinformation about how HIV was spread. And there were thoughts that it could be spread by hugging, or by using someone's toilet seat, or by wearing the same piece of clothing as them. And it wasn't just the people who were patients that believed this, it was the doctors and it was the nurses. So the advice that they gave to family members when someone was diagnosed was, well, hug them for the last time, you know, but be careful. Um, and so these folks suffered a great deal of social isolation and a death sentence on top of that and horrific side effects from the medications that were available at the time or not having access to medications at all. Um, so there were two figures that emerged at this time. One was Brownie Mary. Brownie Mary was a volunteer at SF General Hospital in the AIDS ward. She would go and visit with the patients there, and she would bring them pot brownies. And she wouldn't tell anybody what was in the brownies, but she would bring them in, she would give them to the patients, and it would absolutely help the side effects of their medications and the symptoms of having the disease. There was another gentleman in San Francisco, Dennis Perone, who had been an activist for some time, and his partner had HIV. So many of you may have seen the movie Dallas Buyers Club, where you see folks kind of lined up outside the house to get their HIV medication. Well, picture that in the Haight-Ashbury neighborhood of San Francisco, but giving away cannabis. And so this was an opportunity not just for folks to get the medicine they needed, but to actually engage in a community that wasn't afraid of them, to engage in a community that would touch them that would give them the care that they were looking for. And the early dispensary system of the Bay Area absolutely reflected that community. So that when you walked into the dispensary, dispensary, there was a tray of weed laying on the table with rolling papers for anybody that needed it. There was free food available. There was a lawyer there in case you had a legal case pending and you needed some free legal advice. There was peer counseling. There was doggy daycare for folks who had to go to doctor's appointments all day and didn't have anyone to look after their dogs. There was free internet access, when in the early 2000s there was still a huge digital divide going on where folks didn't have access to that. Uh, and it was a place that you could hang out all day long and consume cannabis and do art projects and play in the garden and have a sense of community. Well, as somebody who was studying social welfare, I was like, this does not happen. This does not happen in any other sector of care. I don't care if you're going to a chiropractor's office or a gynecologist's office, you're not going to see the sense of community care. 
So I decided to do my doctoral dissertation on how these medical cannabis facilities, I'll tell you about that in a second, were operating as healthcare providers. Because I knew that as we got more into regulation, we were gonna see these social model dispensaries kind of become Walgreens and CVSs, and we have. So I felt that it was very important to capture what was happening at this time because cannabis was really leading us into an alternative healthcare way that we've seen taken off since then, coupled with the intersection of people being more and more um, concerned about pharmaceutical drugs. So I said medical cannabis facilities, and I just said this is a caveat, because this is also, I think, a great piece of history. So in 2002, the dispensaries were afraid to call themselves dispensaries. They were afraid that it would implicate them as dispensing something to the public, which in California, except for Prop 215, which is basically one paragraph, um, they really didn't have permission to do. So they didn't want to be named as dispensaries in my research for fear of legal retribution, so they asked to be called facilities um, it's because they felt that it would be safer for them. Anyway, so I did this study back in 2006, and I did a study of 130 medical cannabis patients to find out more about how they were utilizing dispensaries and what they were getting from that. Just to give you an idea of how little we knew back then, this was 16 years ago, 130 patients, it was the largest sample of medical cannabis patients in existence. <laughs> That's nothing. Um, and so out of this survey, which I have to give credit to Dr. Frank Acido and Dr. Todd Micaria, who were really pioneers in the medical profession of cannabis, Dr. Micaria being a psychiatrist, Dr. Lucido being a family practitioner, one of the first doctors in California to recommend cannabis, had a very long and extensive intake form that he asked all of his patients to fill out. I borrowed heavily from this intake form for my dissertation research instrument, and one of the questions on that survey was, are you using cannabis as a substitute for something else? Now, I just threw the question on there because it was on Dr. Lucido's survey, and I didn't really think too much about it until I saw the results. And I saw that 53% of my samples said they were using cannabis as a substitute for alcohol. And then 75% of my samples said they were using cannabis as a substitute for pharmaceutical drugs. And 25% of my samples said that they were using it as a substitute for illicit substances. And I thought, wow, you know, this is harm reduction, which I was a very big fan of as a paradigm. You know, the idea that you don't have to demand abstinence from someone who's using substances in order to make their lives better. In fact, a lot of times it makes their lives worse if they're not ready to go that route. Anyway, we can talk about it during that time. time. <laughs> um, but I saw that and I thought, well, this is really interesting because if we can think about cannabis instead of a gateway drug but as being an exit drug, then maybe there's some potential for it as an addiction treatment. So of course, if you see something interesting in your research, the first thing you want to do is replicate that research to see if what you found is just a fluke or if there's really something there. So I replicated that study again a few years later with 350 patients, and I found the same thing. And then my colleague, Philippe Lucas, up in Canada, replicated that study with 1,000 patients in Canada, and we found the same thing. And so we really felt that we were on to the fact that patients were absolutely engaging in this substitution behavior and that they were having good outcomes as a result. From that really morphed the discussion about the opioid epidemic and the role that cannabis could play in helping this. Now we've seen population-based data on this. The study that came out in 2015 in JAMA that showed a 25% reduction in opiate-related mortality in places that have medical cannabis laws. We've seen significant reductions in uh, Medicare Part D reimbursements for opiates in states that have access to cannabis. We see all of this really great data on the population level, and then we hear patients saying, oh, this absolutely works. Yes, 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 like 99% of patients say that it works. I did a study on this last year. They all really like it. Well, we haven't been able to do largely because of both the addiction paradigm that we have decided is okay in this country, and because the Schedule One status of cannabis is really study this as a clinical outcome study, uh, where we're matching patients who are using opiates and patients that are using cannabis and seeing what they're doing. Now, the first of these studies is actually now taking place at the Albert Einstein Medical School in New York, which is extremely exciting. 
But we have a lot of work to do if we're really going to move forward with cannabis as a viable treatment for substance use disorder. Um, part of the problem is, as you know, the line drawn between licit and illicit drugs is completely arbitrary in this country. But we've done a very good job of convincing people that all the drugs on one side of the line are okay and all the drugs on the other side of the line are horrible. So we have to have that conversation. We have to have the conversation about what it means for patients to have self-determination about how they choose to get better and the methods they choose to get better. Uh, we have to have conversations about the paternalism that we place upon especially women and people of color in this country about what we think they need to do to prove their worth to us. And cannabis, again, intersects with all of this. So I guess the last thing I want to say is that as you move forward in your cannabis businesses, and very few of you, maybe not even any of you are researchers, but keeping with you the idea of the evolution of cannabis in the social space is going to be extremely important in ensuring that the next wave of cannabis commerce is really in line with that social movement that I first saw 15 years ago and doesn't go the way of the pharmaceutical industry and doesn't go the way of industrialized agriculture. We get to decide that. And one of the ways we do that is by transferring the knowledge, not just the technical knowledge, but the cultural knowledge and the research knowledge and the clinical knowledge is just as important. So thank you so much again for having me and I look forward to talking to you about many things uh, later on. Good afternoon. My name is Randy Simmons. Uh, I was asked to be on this panel and I, my response was, are you sure? <laughs> really started that conversation by saying, I'm not sure I have anything to offer. Then I got a list through the other panelists where I decided I must be here for the comic relief because I <laughs> cannot uh, match uh, what they have done in this industry. One thing I can talk about is passion. And two years ago, sorry, So two years ago I walked away from it was probably the most fun job I'd ever had in my life. Working with great people. Some of you in this room. Uh, some of us not always on the same page in this room. But there was a passion. You know, I think about the passion of people that are involved in this industry and and uh, and I hated walking away. You know, I hated walking away from the past with people like Patrick, who um, donates his time and energy and his life to supporting military survivors of PSTD. PSTD, sorry, I always get that backwards. In fact, I, I have a pen uh, for 22 too many that I wear that Patrick gave me, and others of you in this room that have shared over the years that. So two years ago, I walked away, and, and what's gone on in my life in two years? Um, it's been dominated by um, cancer. So, um, my wife of 43 years, um, in October, a couple of years back, had no cancer in her body. By June, um, she was at stage three. Um, breast cancer, which had um, entered the lymph node system, and and so then how do you deal with that? And that's consuming, but one of the things that's done as it consumes me is I've always tried to figure out what it is you're dealing with and working with, and, it, and um, the unfortunate aspect of that is, fortunate, unfortunate, we went um, to Seattle Cancer Care Alliance, which is probably one of the better cancer um, centers in the world. In fact, there are not a lot of people from other countries that were there because of the care and service that's provided. But it was upset, it upset me and frustrated me to watch what had to happen for a couple of reasons. One, to watch over a 16 week period as my wife's body was filled with poisons that was intended to kill the cancer but if you're aware of what chemo does, and three different types of chemo medicines during that period of time that killed not only 
the cancer cells, but they kill healthy cells, and then you're in that process of trying to rebuild your body after that point. And following that was surgery, a bilateral mastectomy that she went through. Even though she only had cancer in, on one side, she is a BRCA gene individual, which means that her chances are 80% that she would eventually have cancer on the other side, and then removal of her ovaries because BRCA is fed by estrogen, and, and all those things working together to spin, and she would continue to go through this process of dealing. And after that, radiation, which was a seven-week period of radiation. Now, uh, up in North Seattle, in Northgate, there is a proton therapy center which uses a new type of radiation, which doesn't go all the way through the body. Photon radiation um, that most people get was not something that my wife could use because she has a heart issue and that would have burned the heart. So using proton radiation gave her the opportunity to um, not have the radiation go all the way through her body. The downside of that is the insurance companies won't cover that radiation. And that was $149,000 bill um, that the insurance companies would not cover. Um, thankfully and gratefully, many organizations came together to share in that cost. And some of you in this room shared in that cost. And I thank you for that. Um, but what did I do? I started looking. You know, research that's done, you know, the research that these people have done is amazing. And, but there's so much more that needs to happen. And the thing that holds us back is no different today than it was two weeks ago or two years ago. It's no different after um, Mr. Sessions made his comments than it was prior. We need to change where we're at as a nation and how we view what this plant is because it's a plant with many beneficial aspects to it. As long as it's a Schedule One substance, we're not going to be able to do the research or get the research funding. So we need to turn our attention to having changes made at the national level, which means when you go home tonight, please all of you write letters to your elected officials. Uh, because right now, the door's been open for a battle, you know, and, and thank goodness a Republican senator from Colorado stood up and said, you're wrong, we need to do something. So what we need to do is continue the same things we've been doing for the last several years on trying to move the normalization of this plant in this nation to something other than a drug that Richard Nixon hated because he didn't like hippies. You know, so um, it would take all of us moving in a direction to continue to move to the normalization of this plant so we can take the um, medical benefits from it, the nutritional benefits from it, because there's so much that we don't know. And until we get to the point where we can get funding and we can have people not on small research projects, but large research projects. You heard earlier today about the fact um, people from universities go in and have somebody else do the detective work. Why? We have the best universities in the world. Why are we not allowing them to do the research on this? So as my wife was going through these treatments, I started doing research my summer project, so to speak, um, and looked at the work that was done by Dr. Christine, Christina Sanchez in the University of Madrid, and, and the work that she's now moved into her private lab there on cancer. And if you look at some of the um, American media and the stories of the work she's done, it talks about how she slowed down the cancer growth using cannabis. That's not true. She's killed cancer cells using cannabis. And that's the story that needs to get out, not that she's slowed it down, but that she's killed it. And if you look at the work that Dr. Liu at the University of um, London has done in a combination of chemo with cannabis, the result is that you, have, you can get by with killing this gene or this cell with a lot less um, chemotherapy drugs, a lot less impact to the body. And, and no recovery time, you know, no loss of hair, um, no neuropathy, and all the other things that go along with chemo um, for cancer patients. So we need to look at this work that's being done other places, and we need to open up what's going on in this nation. So I was asked to speak here today because of the testimony I gave at a recent hearing, and um, somebody heard that testimony asked me to come and tell a story. So that's why I was here. But it has to be about the passion. What's your passion? If you have a passion for something, then go after it and keep doing it. Um, 
this has become, you know, my, my science project. Too. She's sitting right over there um, to figure out how do we move forward? Because she's through with chemo, she's through with um, surgery, she's through with radiation, but she's not through with cancer. The impacts on her body from these drugs and for these treatments are everlasting and will continue. So what have we been doing to counteract that? Well, we've been using cannabis oils on her neuropathy in her feet because to bring that feeling back and to uh, increase that blood flow again. I also encourage cannabis use from care providers in case anybody wants to know that. Just um, side <laughs> Again, we need to look at what is happening within the medical profession and the insurance profession. So you heard earlier here today about an opportunity for all of you, part of the organization, to have insurance. Well, it doesn't stop there because you have to know what that insurance covers. And so we need a change in both the medical profession, the medical world, and in the insurance world to make sure that the products that can be developed out of this plant and the research that can be done to make sure that we have the right cannabinoid profile and see what the terpenes do based on different diseases. And, and it, I'm sure it's going to be different. If there's different types of cancer cells, do they all work the same? We need all that research done. And so I know I'm sounding like an advertisement here today, for, um, but good, that's what I'm here for. Um, so, yeah, I, I really appreciate this panel. I appreciate you have um, medical doctors that We'll step out and look at um, how the use of cannabinoids can benefit their patients. Appreciate the research that's done at many levels. And if you think back about it, in the early years, you know, the medical cannabis use drove the idea of legalization and recreational marijuana. I'm really hoping that the push for legal um, recreational marijuana in the other states returns the favor. And first is a discussion about what can we do on a national level if we remove the substances of Schedule 1 and let the medical community really do the work they need to do to figure out how to um, change people's lives for the better and so we can eliminate diseases. We look at GW Pharmaceuticals out of England, what they've done with um, oral spray for epilepsy seizures. The drug that drug they call a drug that um, extract they're working on for um, elimination of type 2 diabetes we all need to be aware of those things that are going on and we need to push the elected officials and this nation to move that same direction because then we all get the benefit of what's going on um, for ourselves and for our loved ones thank you for your time
um, 20 years ago, a lot of people were telling me that I was crazy to start studying cannabinoids to schedule one license, why would you do that? And, but there was already some uh, evidence that cannabis had some very promising medical properties. And so I thought, well, um, and, and the, the other advantage that the cannabis plant has is what we call it has a very safe therapeutic index. It, the, the, the profile of side effects is very, is very low, so you really have, there's, there's no overdose that you can obtain from cannabis, so there's that. There's a very safe therapeutic index, and that's what you want when you want to have new medicines. You want to have new medicines that are also safe, not only take care of the disease, but don't induce all the really bad side effects. So I thought um, I thought I'd start studying that and try to optimize those medical uh, properties. The it's a it was a young field that I came into the cannabinoid research field because it was the last drug that people started to understand. People already understood how methamphetamine works, how opioid works, but 20 years ago, we only knew what the molecule was. We didn't have any ideas of the cannabinoid semenic system. So it was a very exciting field for a curious scientist to go into because there's a lot of things that you can discover. And, uh, in shaping the research that we did in my laboratory, the first thing we did is we listened to the patients. If you want to, if you want to develop a therapeutic approach, um, let's start with something that has a lot of promises. And, and the multiple sclerosis evidence were very strong. So we studied how cannabinoids have anti-inflammatory properties for many years. And uh, the two more recent types of research that we've been doing in uh, my laboratory are again because of the strongest evidence. So one is the epilepsy field. It's I think, absolutely remarkable what's happening today. Um, I'm particularly touched because the therapeutic approaches that are being developed for seizures are, are for kids that have these seizures and um, it's always very gratifying to develop new therapeutic approaches that will help the, the young people. So we study how cannabinoids regulate seizures in, um, in, in, different, in different ways. We, we confirmed and extended this, this really exciting result that showed that cannabidiol has anti-seizure properties and, and we're finding results that show that maybe cannabidiol might not be the only molecule and maybe we can complement and start having this concept of entourage effect. So I think this is very promising and it's just the beginning. I think there's a lot of research that we can do to continue optimizing that. And then the, uh, the second um, area of research is cancer. Um, we, um, we followed up on the steps of, of those Spaniards groups that showed that cannabinoid compounds can actually directly kill cancer cells. They're not terrific for all cancer types, but some cancers actually respond remarkably well, and it'd be really interesting to understand why this cancer type responds very well. And the other thing that uh, uh, we, we did is if it's not working well for other types of cancer, maybe we can optimize it and make it better. So those are the two big efforts that are happening, particularly in, in, uh, in, in my lab. And our goal is from a very basic research, from a concept, to move this forward and create a new type of transformative medicine. The word transformative is very important. It means that medicine has a lack and that we create something that will actually fill this, this need. Um, and I think that the cannabinoid compounds have that ability to actually hit at some diseases that we're not able to uh, address now. For example, the Dravet epilepsy. These kids are not able to be treated by any of our standard care, and cannabinoids have a remarkable effect. So we're doing this effort, and we're trying to push this forward uh, into uh, clinical trials, and we're working with NIH very closely. We're working with some pharma. 
we actually started a company uh, around this technology, so really we could actually protect this and go all the way. So that actually was an interesting step for my career five years ago when we started this company because I started thinking about the business aspect. What does it mean to start a company, all start up, and the challenges? And there's so many young entrepreneurs in this room and uh, the challenges that we face in starting companies. So I started getting really interested in uh, business questions, which is so not an academic way of thinking. Uh, so it was a really nice compliment. And I think that's also why I really enjoy being part of this current community is, is because we are able to kind of uh, have the, both the, the research and, and the business and development uh, part uh, talk to each other try to work together. And then, uh, and then I-502 started uh, germinating several years ago, and I always was very interested in legal and policy making uh, questions. So I had the chance of helping for um, I-502 on one of their panels to provide some advice. And I love the part where when in policy making, uh, the legislatures actually reach out to scientists to provide some framework of what are the results and how can we actually shape the legal structure. I think that's very, very, uh, very strong way to, to work together. And uh, so I've been in very close touch with the University of Washington Law School, the uh, Cannabis Law and Policy Project, because again, I think it's very important that there was uh, some interactions between the lawmakers and the scientists that gave us the opportunity to actually work with the Washington State Liquor and Cannabis Board and we each time we're able to provide some advice and maybe some help we're always kind of ha um, happy to, to do so and then uh, about three or four years ago a group of leaders at the University of Washington including myself were really uh, decided to step up and try to, to organize the, um, the forces that we have at the University of Washington because we're in the middle of an extraordinary big experiment that's happening in, in, and it's our duty as academics to try to help and, 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 and do some research and, and help that, that all this process have, goes well. So, we, uh, we formulated the, the idea of creating a center for cannabis research that would be an entity that could help and, uh, and, and perform some, some research on the academic uh, ground. So we, this group of leadership, we went several times to Olympia and had some very productive discussions with some senators and some representatives. And so we're all trying to work together to try to implement this center so that uh, we can actually perform the research that is really uh, necessary in these times of, of, of legalization. And as we are building this center, which is currently still very virtual, but what we've done is we've kind of reached out and tried to understand who are, who are the academics that are interested in cannabis research. Um, of course, there's the Stella Lab because we've been doing that for 25 years and we have a schedule one and we've been there from the beginning. So we reached out and what we realized is that there was, um, there was over about 50 different very high quality teams of researchers at the University of Washington that are interested in cannabis related questions. And the, the breadth of, of interest is extraordinarily large. It's, there's the medical school, there's the law school, there's the social work, so many uh, forestry, so many actually academics that understand that it's part of their mission to study this, this plant and, and try to help out. And so we're very excited to, to, to mobilize all this uh, intellect and, and, and try to, try to sell, help out. We need to think we think we need to think about the, the cannabis field as a, as a as a continuum. It's a very broad continuous field, and unfortunately, currently society is very polarized. Either it's the best thing ever, or it's close to the devil. <coughs> and I, that's too polarized. And I think as uh, that's one of the message that I think the uh, this 
scientists are trying to, to, to portray is that it's a continuum and then there's going to be specific questions that we need to address in, in, every, in every aspect. The health aspect is uh, there's a toxicity profile that's associated to cannabis use. It is clearly not good indication for women that are pregnant. There's very, very strong evidence that it could be toxic to the embryo. Uh, I believe that's an actually an easy fix. It's just about educating people that they're not supposed to be using it. Uh, young people also, uh, very good that we have a legal uh, system that uh, uh, limits the age of use. The harm reduction is very interesting. So from toxicity, then now we have harm reduction we might actually substitute things by cannabis and reduce the harm. And then there's tremendous benefits. So that's at the health level, at the industry level. These are new jobs. There's new uh, concerns about the job, um, whether there's some toxicity associated with, with, with the pesticides that people are working with. There's many questions that um, need to be addressed and as a continuum. And, uh, and the plant itself actually uh, is so interesting. Uh, there's what, maybe 100 scientific articles on the biology of the cannabis plant and as compared to millions on the tomato. We need research. There's a potential that is tremendous in, in, in understanding this plant. It, even if you've been talking about the DNA and the genetics, actually it has a very special DNA. And therefore even uh, geneticists uh, of the plant are just fascinated by the, the mer, uh, beauty of, of, of the genetics of this plant. So there's really a tremendous amount of research to be done. So we've been, uh, we've reached out uh, at the University of Washington with other entities to try to synchronize our efforts so that we're not the only ones. So we're talking to WSU to see what they're doing and try to synergize. We're talking to other states. What are you doing in California? They're starting centers for cannabis research. Can we actually coordinate our efforts? So we're, we're trying and I think uh, it is moving forward and they're, they're, we need to, to and I think, in conclusion, I think I, um, what we're realizing is this world is changing very, very rapidly. And, uh, and we're all very excited about this new chapter that we're helping to write. And I think by working together, we need to be able to foster what the benefit of what's happening. There's so much benefit in this new chapter, and we need to be concerned about reducing all the potential toxicity. Or, or, or side effects or pitfalls of this industry as a continuum. So that was my time allocated, and we'll be happy to discuss some of the specific questions that you have. Thank you for being here today. Danielle, come forward, please. So what we in this association, what we will do is adapt very quickly to try something we think is going to give added value to businesses that help sponsor. So that's what we're going to do really quick, then we're going to take questions. So Danielle, and here. Right here. Did you enjoy this panel? This panel is sponsored by Buddy's Recreational. Buddy's Recreational is a unique cannabis experience celebrating the historic ne nexus of music and marijuana. Buddy's is dedicated to bringing their customers the best products, the best prices, as well as being active participants in the community. Thank you, Miles. Time to picture. <laughs> we'll be here in just a moment. Here's what we're, we talked earlier about that value added. This is a business association. These businesses are sponsoring. We want to get a media available, good use picture for their marketing. <laughs> we will do this at the next panel as well. All right. Ten minutes for questions. I will mention to you, I love this industry. I love the panels. You know, I do this because I love it. 
And one of the things I love about it, other than the brilliance, is what I hear in sentences. I've helped companies and groups like this all over the country for almost 30 years. Never have I heard acupuncture and masturbation in the same sentence. <laughs> I love that. Question. Okay, I've got four questions over here. We have only 10 minutes. Let's, let's take the one first. Uh, Randy, I want to thank you for coming. And I actually, my question to you is that I, I would like for you to reiterate and explain a little bit something from your testimony before the LCD about home growth, which is that you connected the difficulties that you've been through and the need for medical research with the viability and, 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 and desirability of home grow with as little regulation as possible. I'd like you to possibly elaborate on that today. Okay, quickly. Well, quickly, it's because I think until you get to that point where that is allowed, you're not going to normalize this plan. And that was the key. Um, so I, in case anyone don't know, have a five-year-old who um, does not respond to high CBD. She responds to high THC cannabis for her terminal genetic disease. And Washington State, particularly, to be completely honest, I'm glad the coal memo is not something they can stand on anymore because preventing youth access is just reefer madness 2.0. Um, and as the mother of a child who has no options left other than high THC whole plant cannabis oil, um, I see a big concern in the industry that businesses are saying, well, we're keeping it away from kids. And I have to wonder what's happening to the hundreds of pediatric cannabis patients under the age of 18 years old that have products, the only products they're able to take because they can't smoke, um, are all labeled with a sticker that says not for children. Um, and I think as business owners, it is your responsibility to step up and service these patients. Um, I'm forced to educate my doctors because no one is doing it for me. And I see this panel knowing Sunil, who has been instrumental in aiding in pediatric education, especially around CBD not being the only cannabinoid. And I wonder if any of you other panelists are taking steps to address this big concern that it needs to become an issue that cannabis is for children. So I know that um, Rafael Mokul and did 35 years ago go did a study on epilepsy and um, the problem that he presents and also what we're saying we're saying on this panel too is that no one wanted to do the clinical trials. Number one, it was illegal, and then there's also great expense to do the clinical trials. So we're kind of at a point where um, they're starting, but it's you know, not happening fast enough because of the legalities. It's, it's, it's criminal. I mean, it is criminal that this is criminal. Um, let me just say one quick thing for everyone. The FDA allows the manufacturer of pharmaceutical THC, which is THC and sesame seed oil and a soft gelatin capsule, which has been on the market since 1985, it allows the manufacturers, and now it's multiple manufacturers of that, to label it, an FDA approved label, which has pediatric dosing guidelines for pure THC. That's FDA approved. And, and, and Israel also has done studies in inpatient pediatric oncology wards with vaporized cannabis. But uh, the FDA point, I think, should drive home any doubt that the medical system doesn't, you know, they, uh, allow or think about THC for, for pediatric patients. Next question. Um, so I guess my question really quickly is that um, you mentioned a lot of the uh, trials of CBD is added to treatments for children, things like that, and in the pharmacological data from that, you'll see that CBD acts on the cytochrome enzymes, and so because of that, these kids that are on childhood epilepsy medications, the CBD itself, while protecting the brain, isn't necessarily stopping seizures, it's inducing a, the blocking of the liver enzyme, which is raising the levels of the medication already on. So is it really CBD stopping seizures or CBD simply raising the medication levels, which are then more efficient in stopping the drug with less uh, side effects? And the same thing, side effects are associated with cancer treatment for specific cancers um, and induced. So perhaps all of this therapy is not so much from the cannabinoids uh, directly, but from the induction of these liver enzymes. <laughs> That was a 
really great Thank question. You, that was a great idea. We will do the research. <laughs> I just want to call the club of them, like you mentioned. So if we, if we now know that it does interact on those enzymes, like grapefruit. Right. I mean, so you do have to, if you're using CBD with patients who are on pharmaceutical, different pharmaceuticals, you need to be familiar with the drug drug interactions between okay. CBD and other drugs. And there's nice tables that have been published. Uh, there's a great Medscape article by a pharmacist. Um, the University of Alabama group that's done clinical trials in CBD. Warfarin. Um, or, yeah, Warfarin's on there too. There's a whole, you got to really know the list and you got to know, uh, and then a doctor in um, uh, Colorado, um, I'm blanking on her name right now, but she's been done a lot of the early uh, pediatric uh, epilepsy research. She's also put together a table. So compiling a few of those tables, and I'm happy to send those to anybody. Uh, if you email me, I can. Um, I think it's important to know that there are costs. You have to watch for those high levels because those drugs don't have as wide a therapeutic window as cannabis does. So if you do get into higher levels, that could impact your you know, liver enzymes and other things, so you should monitor those drug levels. One of the things that's really one of the things that's really good about the summit is while he was asking his question, I could see eyes lighting up all over. Okay. Then the question gets asked, and you hear, "Well, we could." Every time I've heard that, this is the fourth summit now I've done. The next summit is, here's what we found out. So go for it. Any other questions? I just had a question regarding the research that you guys cited a lot of really promising stuff. Uh, is there an easy way for the general public to access this information? Can we start sharing on social media to educate people so that they can get rid of some of the ignorance in the community? Yeah, I mean, one of the big horrible things about research <laughs> is that it's largely kept from the general public through the cost of journal subscriptions. <laughs> and when I was a professor at Berkeley, I had access, I, you know, I had access to everything that the University of California subscribed to. Now that I'm not anymore, I don't have access to anything unless it's an open access journal, which means that the author pays for their own copyright. And every time I publish something, I publish it open access because that's who my research is for. It's for the public. It's not for people sitting in you know offices in academia. ResearchGate, I think, is a good uh, tool out there. Um, I know Sunil is on there. I'm on there, so you can follow us as researchers, and we upload everything that we publish onto there so that people can download it. So that's a really good resource. Um, the Drug Policy Alliance, where I used to work, which is just drugpolicy.org, has a really good repository library on their website as well um, that has a ton of, um, of articles that you can access. Um, but it is a big issue. I mean, the, the ability of the general public to access the academic literature is a, is, is a huge issue. Maybe I'll, I'll add real quick to that. Uh, there's a there's a gap. There, these scientific papers are really heavy and, and hard to read. You don't want us to be spending your time <laughs> reading those. What we need is uh, we need we, a, 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 so the solution is to, there's actually a website at the University of Washington, the ADAI website, where you have scientists that actually that read the literature and then summarize it. And so therefore, what we're trying to implement is a website where your questions, you can go and say, so what is the deal about cannabidiol and anxiety? And you would have an, area, you have an area where you can actually click and say, these are the strongest results and this is what it's done. So there needs to be some kind of filtering. And, and I think that's our job as academics is to gather because there's so many papers and some are not the same quality. So you need a first level of, of filtering and, and that's what we're trying to accomplish. So we're working in, in that. Okay, final question. Thank you. Uh, this question is for Simeon Kaysen. Um, so earlier you were talking about how uh, getting high dosages of whole plant CBD to patients is very expensive, and we know that. And I'm a whole plant guy, and I'm not a big fan of isolates, except it does seem to be uh, appropriate to spike patients' medicine that's already whole plant with CBD isolate to just get that aspect way up within the bed of the rest of the cannabinoid profile. What do you think of that? Sounds good. I mean, you know, we should try it. it seems like. <laughs> <laughs> CBD, again, it's high safety. I'm all about clinical safety and efficacy. And if you have the risk-benefit ratio is, is appropriate, then you should do it. I mean, that's, this is how a lot of these things are, are being done. We have to practice. This is a new frontier. Uh, I try to use the latest studies 
that I can find to inform the, 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 research, uh, the treatment that I'm doing, and you can track patients. That's the whole beauty of clinical observation. That's how cannabis in medicine was you know, described 150 years ago in Western medicine, was people just dosing it on subjects like William O'Shaughnessy or, or Dr. Richard Reynolds or Sir William Osler. They were just doing this kind of, well, I've got this tincture. Let's see what happens with the migraines. Okay, they went away. That's how much did I use? So because I got really good safety information, I, I would be happy to, as long as that crystal CBD is coming from a reliable source that you know it's um, you know, clean and uh, free of any toxins, uh, you can you can definitely dose that way, and I think there's a lot of research that suggests that whole plant CBD, the synergistic effect of that is stronger than the, the, the uh, single chemical. So if, you, if you're going to do that, that, that makes sense. But it would be really nice to get more CBD whole plant available in the shops. I do think anyone that can grow should grow, and I have all my patients who you know are interested in that, you know, at least maximize their plant counts so that they can trial and error, like uh, Kevin Jody was talking about earlier. Next, we have a short, thank you, first of all.